because Set Beasts might be the best indie game this year. Unfortunately, it launched right before Tears of the Kingdom, so as a result, I missed out on this game, and I'd imagine I'm not the only one. That's a real shame too, because after I played it, I had to seriously question if this was my game of the year, and just as a reminder, these are some of the games that I played this year. Now, I know that's a lofty claim, but allow me to explain exactly why this game made me feel this way, and by the end, even if you're not fully convinced, maybe you'll be interested enough to give it a shot. So let's start with a question. What is Cassette Beasts? Originally, I planned to answer this question the same way everybody else does. It's kinda like Pokemon, but I feel as though that's doing it a disservice. It would be like comparing a cyclist to a runner. Sure, they're both trying to accomplish the same fundamental goal of go somewhere very fast, but the methods by which they achieve that goal are entirely different, and as a result, how we measure them is as well. This is all to say that while Cassette Beasts shares some fundamental similarities with Pokemon, its depth, mechanics, story, and even general gameplay loop are so dramatically different that it wouldn't really be an apt comparison. Now, with all that said, Cassette Beast at its most basic level is a game about doing three things exploring, constructing a team, and fighting bosses. These three systems synergize brilliantly in a way that I've only seen in games like Elden Ring, Breath of the Wild, Outer Wilds, and other exploration-heavy masterpieces. This becomes easy to understand if you go through these three key concepts of the game and ask why to each of them. So let's start with, why would you explore in Cassette Beasts? The game takes place on an island with small dungeons, puzzles, and treasure. It's inhabited by humans and monsters, the latter of which you can record with your cassette player and add to your team. Don't think about it too much, it just works. Speaking of these monsters, certain monsters grant you traversal abilities once recorded, like a glide or a dash. These abilities make traversal even easier and unlock new areas to explore. By extension, this also unlocks new dungeons and monsters. If you're familiar with good open world game design, this should immediately stand out to you as a bit of a cycle. Everything in exploration benefits everything else. All of the systems work together to create a cohesive and meaningful experience when you explore. Now let's go a bit more in depth on the aforementioned monster encounters, because the combat in this game is a astonishingly good. It actually does something similar to games like Fury, Dark Souls, and Monster Hunter. Combat isn't based on stats as much as it's based on skill. Granted, this game is still turn-based, so you can't just walk into an endgame area at level 1 and run through it because you've got the right strategy, but you can get pretty close. So every combat encounter is a double battle. This immediately solves one of the biggest problems with monster catching games, which is, if you're not one of these, you don't matter. Granted, I'm exaggerating a bit, but a monster with low defense and low speed is a effectively useless as they'll just get killed long before they can make a meaningful impact with all that attack they have. Thanks to double battles, this isn't the case in Cassette Beasts. In fact, by the end of the game, one of my most used monsters was exactly that archetype, high attack with low speed and defense. This also plays into why strategy matters so much. Maybe you'll have a monster that has basically no offense at all, but has more than enough HP to put up walls and debuff your opponents. Glass cannons become more nuanced here as well, since now, even if you take out one monster, there's still another one on the field, so how will you ensure this glass cannon survives? You could simply use two of them and attack so relentlessly that your opponent never gets the chance to fight back, or you could go for a safer strategy with a more support-heavy monster. However, combat becomes exponentially more intricate with the chemistry system. Types aren't super effective against others in the traditional sense, but instead react to each other. For example, if an ice type gets hit with a water type attack, you'll still deal normal damage, but you'll also give the ice type a defense buff since water freezes on impact. If you burn a plastic type, they'll release toxic fumes and become a poison type, and if you then burn that poison type, because the poison is flammable, they'll get the burn status. This system can seem complicated and overwhelming at first, but you'll quickly learn that most of these interactions make logical sense. Burning an ice type will melt them and turn them into a water type, wind can be used to blow out a fire and weaken it, and pressing this red button makes this funny number go up. This is such a clever system because it creates dozens of different interactions along with near endless strategies that the player can utilize to take advantage of them. The final part Part of this that really brings it all together is the fact that the game allows you to experiment with practically no barriers in your way. Your character has a level and the strength of your monsters is heavily based on that level. To make this even better, all of your moves are recycled. You get these stickers that you can use to teach your monsters new moves, but if you get rid of a move that a monster already has, that move gets turned into a new sticker, and there's no limit to how many times you can do this. This means that every single monster in your party will always have access to all of your best moves so long as they can learn them. So if you record a monster 
monster early in the game, you can use it near the end with almost no investment of either time or resources. This allows you to quickly and easily try out new combinations and strategies. But as if all of this wasn't great enough already, the game throws one final curveball at you, the fusion system. This allows you to fuse two monsters mid-battle, sharing their moves, stats, types, and even their buffs and debuffs. Crucially, the fuse mechanic is not a win button. As powerful as it may seem, there are a few downsides to it. First, you only get one move per turn now since there's only one monster on the field. Second, as I already mentioned, all of your debuffs are shared as well. If the enemy has a strategy to lock down one monster, they can use that on your fusion and you're basically cooked like a Thanksgiving turkey. Equally, types are shared as well, along with all of their collective resistances and weaknesses. With all of that said, if used correctly, fusion can be overwhelmingly powerful and is borderline essential in taking down some of the most menacing enemies you'll run into. Naturally, all of this may seem unbalanced in the favor of the player, but the bosses counteract all of this in their own unique ways. There are three types of bosses in Cassette Beasts. Let's start with the most simple. The rogue fusions are wild monsters that have fused. The only thing special about them is their buffed stats and move pool. They attempt to counter the player by simply overpowering them. Defeating these monsters will grant you tons of materials that you can trade for items, and these fusions are sometimes made of unique rare monsters that you can record. The second type of boss comes in the form of captains, human opponents who take full advantage of the chemistry system. These fights not only present a challenge, but also teach you some extremely effective strategies that you can use yourself, and even unlock new items to buy at the shop in the main town. Finally, there are the which I'm barely gonna talk about for story reasons. The are exceptionally powerful and introduce their own unique mechanics to each fight. They're also unaffected by the chemistry system, making them even more threatening. And just as a bonus on top of all of this, if the difficulty still feels skewed in either direction, you can adjust both the level scaling and the intelligence of the AI to perfectly match what you're looking for. So that's a lot of information, but here's a brief summary. You explore the world to collect monsters and stickers that you can then use to create the most powerful team possible with the best strategy for victory. You can then use those monsters in that strategy against the bosses who grant you materials to buy special items in the shop, unlock new items for that shop, and progress the story. And speaking of that story, while indies are often praised for their gameplay, the writing in Cassette Beasts is arguably just as good as the mechanics of the game itself. In fact, it has some of the best writing I've ever seen in an indie. Game. Cassette Beast is a game whose characters are more important than the story itself. This isn't to discredit the story, but instead to say that of all the indie games I've ever played, this one stands in a league by itself when it comes purely to how the characters are written. Now, while obviously I'm not gonna say too much about the story or the characters to avoid spoilers, I can give you a synopsis of the plot. So the game begins when your character washes up on the shores of an island called New World. Upon doing a bit of exploring, you get jumped by a quirky little dude with a traffic cone on his head before being saved by a woman named Kaylee. She introduces you to Harbor Town, the main hub, and explains that the people here just randomly appear on the island and no one's been able to find a way out. However, after encountering your first you learned that there might be a way. The wonderful part of this story is the contrast between it and the world around you. You've got these tranquil, reflective moments where you'll discuss the mysteries of the island and the struggles of life before it, while learning about each of your partners that you'll meet on your journey. And something about these conversations just feels so real. I mean, I swear I've had some of these exact discussions with some of my actual friends. There's this scene from Chrono Trigger where your party, in a similar setting, discusses their adventure up to that point. They throw out some ideas and theories as to why all of this is happening, but crucially, there's no real conclusion. They don't have the answers, and there's something strangely comforting about that. A lot of these conversations in Cassette Beasts are the same way. They're not here for some exposition dump that explains away everything you see or experience, because that's not how conversations like this work in real life. You throw out your best theories and ideas, and sometimes that's all you can do. But that contemplative nature is what makes these interactions so special. Now, that's not to say every conversation is like this. The ones with more concrete answers will either build upon these lovable characters or give you pieces of information that'll stick with you for days on end. And on the other side of this coin, on the other half of all of this, is this lighthearted feeling of wanderlust that this world invokes. I mean, one minute you're talking about whether or not material things actually matter and what the true meaning of life is, and the next you're fighting something called a puppercut. It's thanks to this game's ability to execute this brilliant balancing act that it's able to have a level of depth and thoughtfulness while remaining cheerful and lighthearted. You're all trapped on an island with no way out. Some of these people have been here for years, and yet there remains this jovial feeling of it all while harboring sorrow, regret, and confusion just beneath the surface. 
However, it's exactly because of these negative emotions that permeate this game that in spite of it all, it has an overwhelming sense of hope. Now, despite all of this, you could argue that the gameplay and writing aren't even the best parts of Cassette Beasts. When I first heard about this game, I thought, with a name like Cassette Beasts, this game has to have good music. And you know what? It might be the best I've ever heard in an indie game. This isn't even mentioning the expertly crafted side quests, the interesting and thought-provoking lore, or even the later parts of the story that I can't talk about. The developers made something truly remarkable here, and more important than its quality is its character. This game is special not because it copied something else, but because it made its own path, chose its own style, and absolutely mastered it.